Um, I know we've got quite a number of visitors from the cultural sector as well as, uh, I hope, uh, more and more staff from the State Library and the other cultural institutions here. I want to uh, welcome you all here and also pay respects to the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered here. Um, we want to acknowledge uh, their elders past and present. And we want to specifically today talk about, uh, we'll have the CSI, CSIRO uh, present on the digital economy and to look at the uh, outcomes of the 2014 report. And um, the report uh, included quite a lot of, um, I think, quite contentious claims about the uh, GLAM sector. And particularly when I'm looking at it from the perspective of what libraries are doing in the digital space, I think um, to be called digital dinosaurs is, uh, is contentious. And uh, I think, well, certainly when I was interviewed, I did uh, express the view that I thought um, that didn't really apply to um, the library sector, certainly not this library. And uh, so I made my views um, quite uh, well known at that point. And I can tell you that in the last five minutes I've been confronted with even more questions about what does this mean for libraries and how do libraries interpret their role in this digital age. And, um, and the, also the assertion that Australia's cultural institutions risk losing their relevance if they don't increase their use of digital technologies and services, uh, which has also come out of the report. And uh, I think that uh, we've certainly taken that on and it's not something we've just taken on in the last two years. I think the library sector particularly, but I understand the wider GLAM sector is seriously looking at how we engage with our audiences in the online uh, environment. What does that mean for our, our organisational structures? What does it mean for our collecting and content um, strategies? What does it mean for uh, the way we measure our effectiveness and our impact in the community? So there are lots of ways in which we, I think we are already addressing the changes in our environment. But you're not here to listen to me. We've got here representatives from the GLAM sector and online, but also we um, uh, have Troy Brown, who's currently the business development manager within the CSIRO's digital productivity flagship, supporting CSIRO researchers to achieve engagement with industry, licensing agreements, and ongoing impact from their scientific research. And in the last uh, three years, Troy managed CSIRO's equity portfolio, dealing with uh, investee companies and boards, and also managed the CSIRO Cooperative Research Centre Engagement Office. And Dr. Sarah Dodds, who currently serves as the research director for the Digital Economy Program in the CSIRO's Digital Productivity Flagship. And the multidisciplinary research of which that report is part is focused on digital services transformation and driving innovation to enhance the growth of Australia's emerging digital economy. And in the last three years, Sarah has led uh, their research in health services, also focusing on digital innovation. And her career spans Australia's innovation system, having worked in a wide range of organisations, including mining, high tech startups, academia, public and private research organisations. And so I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to introduce uh, this uh, presentation, and then there will be time after the presentation for questions, assuming I haven't spoken for too long. So I'll welcome Sarah. Thank you for that, for that lovely introduction. And I'm hoping um, over the next hour, we're gonna have some fun and stimulate some interesting thinking, perhaps slightly different thinking about digital. Um, when we talked about what we were going to do today, somebody actually asked a very interesting question about, well, what is the digital economy and how do you explain it? And at the moment, the digital economy is one of those quite ephemeral things that means different things to different people. So what I'd like to do, the first half of this talk, 
is talk about why CSIRO is interested in the digital space, what the digital economy is about, and some of the work that we've done in some of the other sectors. And that's kind of about, it's more than you think it is. I'll then hand over to Troy to talk in more detail about the report that came out last year about the GLAM sector and some of the recommendations from that and perhaps stimulate some thinking about what we could do with you guys in this space. Um, so I'm going to start talking out a little bit about CSIRO, about the digital productivity flagship, about the digital economy, um, some of the research that we do, um, some cool science and talking about really why does it matter and how does it actually change things and then Troy will talk about the report. So CSIRO is a really interesting beast. We're not a university, we're not an academic organisation, we are Australia's science agency and that means that we do applied research on areas that matter for the nation and that's actually written into our legislation. We certainly publish papers, we do excellent science along the way, but our purpose is to serve the nation in meeting its big upcoming challenges. We do that in a number of ways. We help government understand what's going on. We have a, a strong role as a trusted advisor. We work very closely right across Australia's innovation system to help it in terms of making advances. We like and really enjoy and work a lot with existing companies and help them transition to future environments. Um, we support the creation of new businesses and we do some pretty cool science along the way. I love putting up this slide um, because this is just some of the things that, that you may or may know that's not know that CSIRO has been um, responsible for. So the LAN, the wireless technology that we all use every day when we plug in our computers is actually CSIRO's. The banknotes that sit in our wallets were actually invented by CSIRO. The Relenza flu vaccine, extended wear contact lenses, Aeroguard, and there's a classic video about Her Majesty the Queen when she came out to visit Australia and Aeroguard got produced to keep the flies off her. Um, I think that's kind of cool. Um, but they're, they're things that have become Australian brand names and really important Australian icons and, and CSIRO is really proud to be standing behind those. Because our purpose is around the future of the nation, we actually organise ourselves into things called flagships. And those flagships are about addressing national challenges. So as you'd expect, there's one on agriculture, there's one about food and nutrition, there's one on biosecurity, there's one for manufacturing and energy. The one that I'm part of is about digital productivity. And that flagship is actually focused on the challenges to Australia about the fact that the whole world is going online. Digital is the ultimate global disruptor. It changes the way we work, it changes the way we play. There's increasing research that comes out that actually says it changes the way we think. And that means that there are enormous opportunities and there are also some quite interesting threats to the Australian economy and to both um, the way we function in our society and, and to um, the way we do business. And so this flagship is looking at those benefits and how we can help realise them for Australia. Given the audience today, I'm going to start with a little bit of storytelling and taking you back through history. Some of this isn't going to be completely historically accurate, so to the historians in the audience, and I suspect there are a few, please let me offer my prior um, apologies, but the sense in what I'm saying um, is there. And essentially, what I want to talk about is a potted history of information, communication and social structures. And the central theme that sits behind it is that as communities get bigger, information sharing across those communities gets more difficult. And the cost to individuals in the information sharing that's required takes up more of their time. And different media have actually then helped change the sort of community sizes we can engage in with some really profound implications. So if we go right back to the beginning, in the very beginning we had a verbal economy. People didn't read and write. We had a village. It was a very small community. And everything was quite personal. You knew everybody, and you knew what everybody did. And people made things individually for people in the village. And storytellers and traders were the people who um, connected those communities. And the communication timelines were actually how long it took those people to travel between communities. And that was quite a long time, weeks or months even. As communities got bigger, this got to be slightly more difficult because there were now too many people in the community for everyone to know everybody else. And so the governance 
Instead of being essentially by the group deciding together what they were going to do, governance became by congregation. You had to get people together into a group to be able to efficiently broadcast a message to them. So that's where church sermons became very important and town criers became very important in terms of ways of spreading information. And the cost and the load of this information sharing grew, but knowledge was power. So having somebody having told you something that you knew that other people didn't because they hadn't been told actually was a form of power. And the errors that used to creep into that were errors of people remembering what they'd been told. That reaches a self-limiting size. And what happened to enable the next step is that the economy started to shift from a verbal economy to a paper economy. More people were reading and writing, and there was a printing press, which meant it wasn't now just a very small elite that could read and write, it now became something that, that more and more people could do. And that actually alleviated a lot of that cost of information sharing, because people could now get information in new forms and digest it in different ways. So this paper economy enabled new models for social interaction. You could write letters to people now and they could read them at the other end. New models for education because you could have textbooks. New models for government, the form. And I don't think I need to say anything more than the form. Um, but retail and trade, it changed the really fundamental things about our society and the way it functions. And there were a whole lot of new services that were now possible because of writing, because of reading, because of the ability to produce things on pieces of paper that you could send to other places. And it was all about you could now do things at scale that you couldn't do before. What we actually gave up in that point was actually a lot of personal aspects of society. So this is where some of the industrial revolution came along. We started accepting that we could buy clothes in standard sizes that didn't quite fit us. The, the days of bespoke clothing started to, to die down and it didn't quite fit you but it was so much cheaper than the bespoke alternative that that was actually a pretty good value proposition. We started in mass production of materials. You could have a carpet in one of standard colours, standard sizes, and it was cheaper to manufacture them that way, so you were happy to choose from a range rather than having something that you really wanted. As those communities continued to grow, we had the rise of the cities, and that was very much powered by the Industrial Revolution and jobs. And now we had governance by form. Filing was power. I've got the information that's written down somewhere I can go and look it up. Literature was available to share information. But again, as the cities get bigger, the cost and the load of that information sharing grows. And you start getting a lot of duplication. You have to fill. How many people here have felt they've had to fill out the same information on 20 different forms to 20 different places in a fairly short space of time? I certainly do. I have kids in school and I seem to endlessly have to fill out Medicare numbers and home addresses. And I'm going, guys, you know this. You ask me this every time. But there's a lot of repetition, there's a lot of re-entry, there's a lot of manual sharing of that information. Something written on a piece of paper is actually an image. And you've got to actually, the brain is what we've been using as the copying mechanism for that for some time. And errors crept in due to clerical and transcription errors of people reading that and writing down something they thought was the same but they weren't quite right about. And this was almost the bureaucracy age. In fact, I think we're still at the hopefully tail end of the bureaucracy age, which is about compliance and regulation and large stacks of paper that we need to fill in. What's happening at the moment, which is really interesting, is the digital economy that's coming is another way, step change in alleviating that high cost of sharing information. Electronic information is no longer an image. It's actually something that's electronically readable and electronically reproducible so that you're reducing the, the potential for those clerical and transcription errors because you now actually have access to the raw data that went into them which you haven't had before. And that electronic information and the ability to communicate it in digital form is again leading to new and different models for education because we can now do online learning. People who are watching me over the internet are engaging in exactly that, that kind of online experience. You haven't had to come here and listen that which was the old verbal economy, and you're not reading a transcription of what I've said, which would have been the paper economy. But it also enables new, mo new models for government, for trade and retail, so eBay and Amazon are two really interesting examples of that. Finance is changing with things like Bitcoin. Health and the rise of telehealth is, is changing in that space. So again, it's almost as big, in fact, I think it is as big as the change from the verbal to the paper economy. We're facing a disruption, a change in economy on that kind of scale. And my God, it's an interesting thing to watch unfolding and it's a great time to be alive in, in that sort of period of opportunity. 
And the other really interesting thing about it is that it's recapturing and reinvigorating the personal. We gave up a lot of the personal in the Industrial Revolution in the age of paper because of the economic advantages of doing one size fits all or a set of fixed sizes. With digital manufacturing that's coming with personalised services, we're now returning to an era where we can actually do things that are all about you. I don't think we're very far off a period in time when we're going to go back to bespoke manufacturing for clothes. There's already things where you go into booths and they'll scan your body and they'll tell you an appropriate size. Um, they're talking about knit factories where they'll actually then custom make a garment that you've chosen off the shelf and they've measured, measured you up and they'll make it to fit. So the fact that digital overcomes a lot of those costs of mass manufacturing is going to profoundly change a lot of those models. And that, so that return to the personal, I think, is one of the really key things about the digital economy that's coming. And the other is this new ability to engage at scale. You can have a community that's anywhere in the world. Instead of having to wait for a message to be carried by a storyteller or a letter to be carried by post, I can email or have a chat with a call centre operator in India, if I really want to. Um, or, or my daughter-in-law if she's in England. But all of a sudden, the, the time for that communication, which has been the limit in the size of the communities that you could form, has been overcome in really different ways by digital. So, what is the digital economy? Um, according to some wiser people than I who've put out a report um, the year before last, I think, that they gave a definition that I quite like. And the digital economy comprises social and economic activities, so it's both, that are enabled by the internet or mobile technology platforms and in ubiquitous centers, sensors. So they've got digital communications in there. They offer an information-rich environment. They're built on global, instant, real-time information flows. And that's that bit about cutting the communication time. They provide access 24-7, so anywhere, anytime, any device, I think we've heard a lot about. And they support multiple virtual connected networks. So that's one definition of, of the kind of stuff that's, that's a digital economy. Our take on it is, fits in that kind of environment, but it's, it's slightly tweaked. So to us, it's about the social business and economic models that are coming about because of the digital age. And that's both about electronic information and the ability to transmit it to other places and to share it. It's about the end of the Industrial Revolution. And every time I say that, I have to sit back and think, my God, that's actually something pretty big. And it's about returning focus to the personal. It's about new, potentially global communities through better information sharing, new information sharing, faster information sharing, and reducing, reusing, repurposing, and recycling data. Because we no longer have these clerical errors and these transcription things and the need to re-enter data in multiple places. You've got that data, and you can take it and use that for multiple different purposes. And it's about the digital, economic, and social benefits that come from improving efficiency, performance, and competitiveness of services. It's about increasing the quality of engagement between individuals, governments, and businesses. And it's about, for us, imagining, testing, and then making real what is possible when you start thinking beyond the boundaries of digital. So to give some examples of that, that that's kind of big motherhoody statements and lots of airy fairy things. And, and at one level, it's kind of wow, but at another level, it's I don't quite get what that means. Um, I'd like to just take you through a couple of examples. Some of them are cool science that's, that's relevant to this sector. And some of it are some examples of where we've dug deeply and worked with some partners in particular sectors to help them address some, some issues, perhaps in some unexpected ways. So the first one of these, which some of you may be aware of, um, is that we've been working for a little while on enabling school kids in rural Australia to visit the Australian National Museum by robot. So in their classroom, they have a high-speed digital connection, and there is a person doing the tour, the tour in the museum, and she has a robot. I think that one's Kasparov. They're, they're named after chess pieces. And Kasparov follows her around, so she's effectively doing a tour for one person, which is Kasparov. 
And what he's doing is she, capturing a floor-to-ceiling 360-degree view of everything he can see. So as would happen in a normal kind of museum tour, you being a, a group of people coming through, a lot of them are interested in what the tour guide is saying, and there's somebody up the back who goes, there's a painting on that wall, back wall. I wonder what that painting is. I'd really like to go and have a look at that. And using this interface, he can actually do that because the whole image is being broadcast, so you can have hundreds or even thousands of people participating in this tour, and each one of those people can choose what they want to look at. Whether it's the thing that, that's being um, shown, whether it's the thing that's being talked about, whether it's something else that just happens to be visible in the room that they'd like to learn some more about. That really changes, to, for me, the definition of what it means to go and visit a museum, particularly when you start thinking about the digital overlays and how you can then start popping extra information about, well, what is that painting in the back wall and who was it by and why is it interesting and why is it in the museum? Um, there's also some things there you can see she's, she's dragging over um, something that is a close-up camera so she can actually show the close-up features. You can't quite feel the fleece that she's showing on the, on the merino sheet, but you can get quite close to see the texture of the fibres. So that's cool because it's different to telepresence. It's quite an immersive experience and it scales. So we, we've looked at this for the museum space, we've looked at it in terms of doing hospital rounds, in terms of how do you train a hospital intern out at Alice Springs who doesn't have access to the big um, Sydney hospitals. You can actually do virtual hospital rounds. You could do virtual gallery tours. Um, there's lots of, of potential for that kind of technology and a different kind of experience. Um, another one that's quite cool, and, and one of the um, technical geniuses behind this happens to be in the room at the moment, so I've got to be careful I get the details right. Um, one of CSIRO's responsibilities is we're actually um, responsible for Australia's national collections of species. So for the Australian insect collection, we actually have the single physical specimen that defines each of the insect species that we have. And there's a practice between the people internationally who hold those collections of sharing the species, and sharing those physical samples so that you can compare whether something that they found in their country happens to be the, actually the same species and it's there in, in two continents or in two countries, or whether they're different and how they're different. And there are a whole lot of scientific um, needs behind that. But of course, what happens when you send things by post, even by courier, even carefully packaged, is it's actually a destructive process and over time these specimens get damaged. Um, what Matt and the Australian Collections team have, and the Atlas of Living Australia have been doing is they're actually digitising those defining samples of, of what it means um, to be. This one I think is a, a... Matt, it's a wheat something. Weevil. So that sample is four millimetres long. And what these guys have figured out how to do is how do you take a four millimetre sample, mount it in a way that you can actually capture a 3D representation of it, get the textures right, get the surfaces right, so it is actually a true representation of everything about that sample. And then you can instantly share it with any other collection in the world. You can share it with anybody who's found one in their back garden or in their, in their farm and be able to share that definition without loss of what that species is. So that's actually forming a new kind of collection that CSIRO is, is looking to curate, um, both in this space and, and across a lot of the other natural collections that we look after. Um, I think it's cool and they're also kind of pretty. Um, another interesting kind of collection that may happen in future, um, this is a map that we have developed of the inside of the Janolan Caves. So caves historically have been very difficult places to map. Um, there's a technology called Zebedee, um, which was developed here in Queensland, in fact, um, which is about a person walking around the inside of the, the space and essentially having radio waves bouncing off the various walls as you're walking around, and it builds up a high-definition map of what the inside of that space looks like. So doing that, we've created the first high-definition map of the inside of the Janolan Caves. We've done the Tower of Pisa. I think we've done the Eiffel Tower. We've done a number of monuments around the world. And in many of those cases, they are the first 3D representations of those spaces. Does it belong in a library? Does it belong in a museum? Does it, how do you, and again, it's really interesting if you could then take that to the point where people could walk through those caves virtually and get the same experience as being there if they're unable to travel or, or just can't get to it. 
and it's pretty awesome to look at. So that was the cool science side. Um, in order to, but let's talk about where the rubber hits the road in terms of we are about helping Australia. This is an example of work we've been doing in the government sector for the last five years. We've been working with the Department of Human Services in Canberra about how do you take human service delivery online? What does it take to do that and what are the pieces that you need to put together? Um, and it turns out it's not as simple as you think. You don't simply design, well you can, design a web service and then just tell people that the other, the face-to-face -face service isn't there anymore. Um, that doesn't work and in fact there are a number of steps in terms of you need to design a service that actually works. So we've developed some software which is about web optimization and determining if, where and how people are struggling to achieve tasks on a website and which parts of the website that they're struggling with. So figuring out is the website actually fit for purpose and how are people using it compared to how you designed it. We've got some behavioural economics work we've done about how do you get people who are unemployed and may have a fairly low education level to have a go at doing things digitally. What are the steps in doing that? What are the options? How successful are they? And through applications of behavioural science and behavioural economics, we've been able to give them a 20% uplift in terms of the people who are willing to have a go at digital and stay there. And that, that's um, pretty cool as well. And then how do you listen to what people are saying about the services you provide on social media? Are they doing silly things that they shouldn't, like telling everybody what their customer reference number is because they're frustrated that it won't log on, and which is something you want to jump on very quickly, or people having conversations about, I don't understand whether I should be on Study or whether I should be on living away from home allowance and I'm really confused, or the government cut off my unemployment benefits because I got pregnant, which I believe um, was one story where somebody actually thought that's what had happened, and being able to correct them in terms of, no, this is the policy and this is what's actually happened for your specific case. So how do you engage people on social media because the customers and, and the citizens of Australia are moving onto those spaces, and we've got to figure out how we use that new medium in the way we do our work. Um, another interesting example is around the health sector, which is where I spent some of my past. And you'd be aware there's been a challenge there for some time about how do we reduce waiting times for emergency departments in hospitals. And there's a really good driver behind that, which is the longer somebody has to wait for treatment, unfortunately, the higher the mortality rate is and the worse the health outcomes are. So it is important that people get timely treatment. When we went in and actually did the research with them in terms of what was driving that, um, it turns out that a lot of the challenges are actually in people leaving the hospital at the other end of the process. So if you're not getting patients that are leaving, then the beds aren't getting freed up, so that the, peop the people who are having trouble being seen are the ones who need to be admitted to the hospital, and they're not getting in because there's no beds available, and there's no, no beds available because people aren't leaving at the other end of the process. So then it was, okay, so what's happening in the subacute space and how can we help move through there? But to get to that finding, there were eight or nine different aspects of their operations that we looked into. So that, again, there's a report that's come out in terms of can we predict what your bed prediction is going to be? Can we actually have some predictive analytics conversations about how do we make sure those beds are available when they're going to be needed? What could you do about um, discharge times? Are there different strategies there that would actually help with the people arriving having beds? They didn't know what the challenges were going to be and neither did we until we started the conversation. But what was really important was they knew the question that they wanted to answer. Um, and to me, that's one of the difficult, extraordinary and fascinating things about digital is if you ask a question, you will get an answer. And the challenge now is almost not in figuring out the answer, it's figuring out the right question. And which comes back to what, and, and Jeanette, the questions I was asking earlier about, well, okay, what is your business model? What is your purpose? What are you actually trying to achieve? Not what are the things that you're using to measure it, but what are the things that you're trying to achieve? And in the health space, you know, that's, that's a really interesting um, question. For example, if you're looking at, well, what's the purpose of rehabilitation? Well, it's to get people to go through the rehabilitation process. No, what's the purpose of rehabilitation after a heart attack? Oh, okay, it's actually to stop people having a second heart attack. Scarily, the stats are that only 13% of people do the rehab and 40% have a second heart attack. Okay, so what we're trying to do is stop those 40% of people from having a second heart attack. We know that doing rehab stops that. 
So we developed a telehealth program so that people could do the rehabilitation at home. And the step that we changed through digital was actually the way that information was delivered and the fact that people didn't need to come back to hospital. We removed a whole bunch of the barriers to them completing that by rethinking and re-engineering the process because what we wanted to do was complete some kind of process that stopped them, that reduced the risk of the second heart attack. So in both of those previous examples, we had a clear question. How do we help people go online so that we can improve outcomes because we know more about them, we can offer targeted services, and we also improve efficiency on the way? How do we reduce hospital waiting time so that we reduce the mortality rate and get better health outcomes? And one of the things I'm really interested to explore is what are the questions um, in the GLAM space, and I'm hoping that we'll get some time to explore that. Because once we've got that, we can then think about how does digital make a difference? And that's where this report is seeking to stimulate discussion. <laughs> um, I think that, that's another nice way of putting it. And really start understanding what the drivers are for you guys and how we can engage, how we can get right back to those base level questions. And then we can help figure out how digital can make a difference. And at that point, I'm going to pass over to Troy. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just give you a slight background in terms of the actual innovation study. It was a, uh, a co-funded and uh, study done with CSIRO and the Smart Services CRC, and we put the report out, as most of you would be aware, towards the end of last year. Um, the report came out of a multi-day workshop and a series of interviews that were conducted uh, with key decision makers in the sector around the country. Now, in terms of some of the, the key features that we saw from the GLAM sector, obviously, as you're aware and we've been discussing earlier today, it is very diverse. Um, there is a lot of uh, flow over it, actually, especially more from libraries. Libraries tend to move a little bit more into a, a gallery space and even a museum space at times. Um, archives tend to be very uh, clear in, in what they're doing, but uh, libraries, especially when they're dealing with their individual communities, they, they form a, a larger role in some respects. Um, uh, well, for those of you who don't know, uh, which is probably no one here, but uh, just, just to say the words, the GLAM actually stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives and Museums. So the collection size that we have in Australia is over 100 million objects and the level of digitisation of that collection is currently sitting at about 25% as you can see. Um, in terms of initiatives to further digitise that, they can be difficult to sustain in the long term from a point of view of getting funding for them, but also behind that there is the idea of well, what is the, the driver, if you like. Are we digitising just to digitise or is there some sort of method or, or plan behind that? I, I think one thing to consider in terms of um, where we're going from here is the, the next slide I'll go to, which is the community digital usage and interaction. So, you know, over the last five to ten years, there has been those dramatic changes in how people interact and access and share and engage. In some respects, uh, there is a, a point of view that in 20 years' time, there really won't actually be an internet anymore, per se, as we actually perceive it now. It's going to basically be a, a state of permanent connection and potentially permanent interaction. So that's a real challenge for not just this sector, but all parts of the community and all parts of industry in terms of how they're going to relate moving forward and what sort of engagement models that you may have that uh, will, will add to the relevancy of your organisation. Uh, there are a, a lot of different online and mobile platforms that are around at this stage. That is then another issue in terms of looking at the integration of those. So this is one of the areas that we actually look to see what is happening in the sector and then how we can actually start to involve ourselves and see if there's an opportunity there for how we can actually increase that, that uh, integration, if you like, by use of, of um, the various technologies that we have that will allow the organisations to, to stick to you know, what is their, their key priorities, if you like, rather than get bogged down with uh, 
um, IT related issues that don't allow them to actually then integrate and uh, engage in the way they would like to. Of course, the other major factor about digital usage is that the access that uh, could be coming into viewing your collections could be from anywhere in the world and at any time. And so that's a, another interesting factor that uh, depending upon you know, what you actually have in your collection, you, you could be catering to an overseas market that you might never actually see face to face. So in terms of the actual report and the recommendations from it, there were three major recommendations that we looked at. Um, under recommendation one, we had the four strategic initiatives. And they basically are making the public part of what we do. And in essence, that was an acknowledgement that there is a, uh, a shift required to meet the needs of, of an active public that has access and are very big and growing users of social media. But at the same time, there's a bit of a reluctance to let go of that traditional position of being a curator, curator sorry, of the actual collections. So that's a little bit of a challenge there. Uh, another within the four strategic initiatives was becoming central to community wellbeing. And that takes the form of both a physical space as say a community center, for example, um, but also in the role that collections can play in, in the memory of a community and in community health generally and resilience of that community as things change, as, as the population ages, as the community becomes more diverse ethnically. Um, a lot of these functions that are happening within our society here in Australia are, are magnified in other areas of the world as well. Uh, third point under that recommendation is beyond digitization or creative reuse. Uh, basically, that's looking at the idea of a, of a pool model engaging the public. Uh, they are looking to facilitate the use and reuse of the digital content that you may actually have. But importantly, it's not just about viewing and, and passing around and sharing. It's actually about building or reshaping those digital objectives. Sorry, objects, I should say and thus perhaps even having those joining into your collection in a new way. So a creative reuse and in fact a, 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 an invention, if you like, that can add to that collection. And the fourth part of that was uh, developing funding for strategic initiatives. So there was a, a recognition that the, the basis of funding seems to be moving away from general government support so it look, we're looking at moving towards philanthropy, we're looking towards partnerships with corporate sector and indeed in the uh, direct community support area. Now with the corporate sector partnerships, um, delving down to that a little bit more, it, it was clear that a lot of those partnerships do tend to be rather short term in nature for specific requirements or specific uh, programs if you like. So there is still the challenge to look at a more broader basis in terms of actually how funding could be accessed long term. Now the digital immersion side of things is um, an important part to consider when we're looking at the overall initiatives. Uh, the, as you can read here, the number of devices is basically going up in an exponential scale, and that leads into my previous comment about uh, effectively being a, a permanent connection or a permanent integration process that we should be looking at. So recommendation two. This was about a national framework for collaboration. Now, there are six different areas under here, um, but overall, it's really talking a lot about easy and seamless access. And that access, not so much in terms of access to internet or social media and so forth, that's already happening irrespective. It's more about access and interaction with the glam sector. So the first part of that was uh, digitization and access. Um, actually, some 
probably important part of that is what's something that's already going on within your, your uh, cultural precinct here in terms of your, your cultural playlist app. That's really leading into the area of setting a standard and approach for digitization and collaboration in terms of, of um, that particular initiative. And then there's other initiatives that CSIRO is involved in, such as the Atlas of Living Australia and uh, the insect scan information that S Sarah had showed you earlier. Uh, secondly, digital preservation. The idea that the, uh, the digital material urgently requires a coordinated uh, national standards-based approach to avoid losing access to digital heritage. So it's an aspect that, that needs to be developed of, of how you're going to move forward to make sure that uh, even if things are being digitised, they still may not be lost in the future in terms of changes to formats and, and so forth, which will, will happen. So there also needs to uh, be a look at uh, national approaches to rights. And by that I mean that um, an approach to copyright in the digital environment, um, things such as handling orphan works where the owners are unknown, uh, and also where it also more effectively maintains the rights of the traditional owners of indigenous material, but in a way that, that stimulates creativity and both supports the creators as well. The skills and organisational change within the sector, we're looking there at uh, closing the gap between various practices of, of why some people are acting in a certain way, what type of business or engagement model they may have, and others. Now, a lot of that's dependent upon the size of the organisation itself and the market that they serve, whether it's a, a, a local library or a, a, you know, a country museum in a specialist area or a, or a large uh, city-based one that's serving a different market. And leading on from that, we're also looking at the shared infrastructure side of things. Uh, storage is becoming a bit of an issue in terms of some of the organisations and Effectively, a lot of them actually only have 5% of their collections on show at any one time. So that's a, a big opportunity through digitisation or through other engagement models to allow the public to actually start to engage with the other 95% that's not generally on show. And uh, in general, it's also looking at um, transdisciplinary collaboration and research partnerships. And by that, we mean learning how to communicate and collaborate between different professional disciplines within the sector, with academics and researchers, and with different communities of different culture, for example. And the third recommendation spoke generally about a national leadership and collaboration forum. Uh, in, in that, I suppose we're really referring to just a, a common forum for conversation. And you, you here in Queensland have gone down that road a bit with the um, cultural precinct strategy. That the challenges that will require corroboration, sorry, collaboration across the sector uh, is not just between the major institutions, but it's also in finding a way to, to involve the smaller institutions, the local based institutions in what you're doing, because they obviously serving their communities as well, but sometimes that, that uh, leadership and collaboration doesn't actually flow down to that level. So in essence, I suppose the, the report really was a bit of a talking point in, in terms of actually looking at what will be relevancy for the sector moving forward. And this is uh, one of the areas that CSIRO has been looking into in terms of trying to, to, to understand the space to see if there's an opportunity in the sector. Um, you know, we, we've spoken a little bit about what we currently understand about the sector and some of the related activities that we have been undertaking in the digital space, such as the Museum Robot Project. Um, but it, it's really looking at, you know, is there a need, what is that need, and what are the business models underpinning the engagement strategies that you use in the sector? So the questions that we have is, you know, what is it that you want to achieve? Where do you want the sector to go? And even after that, how do you determine success? Because that success determination is going to change 
as the world becomes more and more integrated and the internet itself, if you like, disappears, but the, the permanent connection and the permanent um, integration and, and engagement continues. So we're looking at metrics that, that underpin what you are trying to achieve, uh, you know, be they visitation numbers or revenue or social media interactions or combinations of all the above or others. So it's to help develop a way forward so that then you can actually be confident about what it is and where that you would expect to head. Um, so in essence, it's, it's about what you can deliver to your stakeholders and to the community and forming the evolution of those business models and engagement. So that's it for us. But thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Is there any, any questions for Sarah or myself? In essence, I, I agree, it is, it is based upon you know, the, the copyright laws, if you like, at an initial point of view, and then it'll be supported by the federal policies. But we, we also, I think, we should be looking overseas to, in terms of how they're, they're viewing that as well, whether there's an, an open access model that we can use to get around those sort of issues, but also still protecting the copyright owner. So we, we don't have a clear answer on that yet at this point in time. I think, I, th I think there are options, and for different organisations, what makes a good option um, will be different. But I look at the example of what's happening in the shopping centre space at the moment. The shopping centres used to be places you went specifically to shop for things that you couldn't get elsewhere, and you went because there was a range of shops there that gave you some choice. They're now having to reinvent themselves as places of social connection. So you go there with a friend. There's, there's armchairs that have appeared in my local shopping centre around coffee shops and, and places to sit and chat. Um, we're recognising that more retail is being done online. And so if you now have the choice between buying online or going to your shopping centre, um, you either, as a shop, choose to have an online presence that means that people can buy from you online, and they're doing that as well, and or come to your shop. So what's the reason now to come to your shop? And it's either to share the experience of, of looking at something and getting an opinion from a, from a friend who's with you or for a pleasant afternoon away from some of the other stresses in your life because it's actually quite a fun place to be and you can have a coffee and have a chat and look at some things. I think that for the, for, for the glam sector there's similar kind of questions um, in terms of digital immersion may well come. If you are a, a, a gallery, what does it mean if you're material is, is available online, you know, apart from the fact there are some copyright issues to be considered, if people have access to your artworks in their own space and in their own time, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think that gets back to some of the really fundamental questions I was asking earlier about what is the purpose of a gallery, what is the purpose of this sector and what are you trying to achieve? And is it to get people to engage with, with cultural aspects of our past and present? because that, that can be done in one set of ways. Is it to inspire, which may be another, require another set of, of ways of thinking about things? Is it to get bums on seats and people to come in through the door so that you can actually keep, keep the, um, the building itself open because it, it serves multiple, um, multiple purposes? So I think the answer to your question actually requires um, a lot of sitting and thinking down about what you do and asking why. 
about 50 times for the, and every time you get an answer asking why that answer makes sense and taking it right back to, okay, when you strip everything else away, this is what we're actually trying to do. So how do we do it? And what, what mixture of them makes sense? Yeah. By the way, can I say thank you to everybody who's been tweeting about this today? Um, I believe there's been, I'm, I've been quietly trying to check my phone over there um, to see what's going on, but, and I know that there's certainly some stuff happening, but thank you to everybody who's joined in that conversation. And if you haven't and you are a, a, a tweeter, um, do go and check it out. Sorry, yeah. I'm just going to say, we, we've actually done another one of these reports a while back about designing health services for delivery over broadband. And what it really comes down to is if you know what the broadband specification is that's available, you can design to it. Um, if you know you're going to be delivering over satellite where you've got quite a long latency, there are some things that work really well over that medium and some things that really don't work well, which include two-way conversations. If you're delivering over fibre where everything is super fast, then there is another range of possibilities that open up. But if you know what you've got available, you can design to it and have some really robust services that, that do what they do quite well. But the more of it that you've got, the more that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, I probably didn't allude to it enough in, um, when I was speaking, but I, I think some of the things that we're looking at in terms of what metrics we can use and, and how we can then use the technologies that we have do actually revolve around drilling down to the social aspects more. And, and it's not so much just about the bums on seats. It is about trying to delve down to explain the experience, if you like, and what impact that has on even on the individual, even apart from the community. But we still very much take the approach that we're trying to build it in such a way that we have these metrics so that we can replicate, so that we can actually understand how it got to that, so that then we can then roll that out so that other people can have the same type of, of knowledge gathering, if you like, and, and, and understand as well. So, Work. 
And he started by saying, well, I'm an economist, but I'm going to give you an economist's point of view about value of social and community factors. And he then proceeded to give some examples. Um, but one example was uh, that in a, in a natural disaster, a community that's got better connections with other people can respond more quickly than uh, a community that is not connected. And then he gave another example of where um, communities that have more women in the workforce, because they've already got in place things like childcare and facilities to get to work and so on, uh, a community like that can be more responsive to economic pressures to either have more or less people in the workforce in a, in a very responsive way. And what he did for me was he was just validating the work we do in our in our sector because he said he, he apologised for being an economist. I'm saying, that's great, we want to hear it in economic terms. So, I mean, for me, that was another opportunity for us to say, there are measures that we don't typically use that allow us to put an argument to our <coughs> governments, you know, to government. Now, I know we're about to end, but there's somebody sitting up the back who's been, I think, putting a hand up, back, up in that back corner. So, so this is where I need to put my hat on and say that CSIRO is a government agency and we don't comment on government policy. <laughs> things that you guys do in the library space is that it's well known and everything I'm seeing is validating this further that the people who have most to gain from broadband and digital understand it the least and what you guys are doing in terms of the access that you're providing and helping people up that that education curve is helping them to really understand the potential of, of what that technology could do um, and I love it. But you need to have enough statistics to actually be able to oh, say something. No, yeah. I agree. Yeah. What we're thinking yeah. about in Queensland is, is a, a whole world away from that. And when people say that the, the physical infrastructure is a given, I'm sorry. In, in no. Queensland, it is not a given. We can't assume that we've got that there and then we just think about what services and engagement. But, but I think, but the, the, I guess another point on that is that access to the physical infrastructure is one barrier. It's not the only barrier, and there are just as big a psychosocial barriers once you've got access to it in terms of getting people to use it. Well, look, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, and I'd like uh, everyone to join me in thanking Sarah. Thank you. Oh, he's get me started on this topic and I can talk for days. Yeah.